Closed captioning for Lift Up Jesus is paid for by our friends at Galpin Ford of Los Angeles. Since the release of Dudley Rutherford's book, Compelled, the response has been incredible. We've been receiving letters, emails, and phone calls from people around the world excited as they learn to share their faith with family and friends. In fact, people are asking for more because the amazing passion that's ignited when we lead someone to Jesus is so exciting. We want to tell more and more. So the Lift Up Jesus ministry has created a special package for those who want to take the next step. For your financial support of $100 or more, we'll send you Compelled, the irresistible call to share your faith and a six-week DVD Life Group series to help you launch your own small group. Plus, Pastor Dudley's entire video sermon series based on the book. Now you can have everything you need to become effective at sharing your faith with people around you. Call or go online today and let us know that you're committed to helping us reach the world for Christ. If you don't give up, if you don't quit, if you stay with it, the day will come where your night will turn into morning, your pain will turn into joy, your sorrow will turn into victory, and you will be rewarded, you will be blessed, and there will be a return on your spiritual investment. Today we wrap up our series on the subject of compelled. When we think about all that Christ has done for us, we can't help but tell others about His amazing grace. Today I have a very important message because there are so many people who are discouraged and there are so many people who are so burdened down by the cares of this world that sometimes we forget what should be the priority in our life. And I want to encourage you today as you watch today's broadcast, listen to me carefully. I want to encourage you that no matter what you're going through, don't ever give up. Enjoy today's broadcast. Six weeks ago, we began with the very first message called uh, Compelled, where we wanted to share that we're com we are to be compelled by the compassion of Christ the commands of Christ, and the love of Christ. And the very first week, we asked you to go outside and to write down names of people. We have several stations out front where we have this plexiglass on both sides. We've asked you to write down the names of people that you would be praying for for these six weeks. And many of you did that. And I want to thank you for those of you that participated and uh, I want to show you a picture of two kids. These kids, their parents, their parents wrote their names down six weeks ago. And last weekend, these two young people were baptized into Jesus Christ. Our world is full of chaos. How many of you know that? It is being driven by the media fueled by politicians, but spawned by the devil himself. The devil came to kill, steal, and to destroy, and he's doing just that. It's amazing to me how many Christians have been swept up in things that divide. Many of us are so vocal when it comes to issues, and we're outspoken in our politics, and we're boisterous and strident in our viewpoints. And we, we will argue all day long certain topics. But when it comes to witnessing or telling someone about Jesus or sharing our testimony, we become quiet as a church mouse. Now, don't get me wrong. I want you to be vocal. I want you to be strident. I want you to be outspoken. But be outspoken about the things of God. Be verbal about the Bible. Be candid and open and articulate about Jesus. 
I want you to get excited about eternal things. We get too excited about worldly things. Why don't you get excited about heavenly things and be, be motivated to share your faith. And as you do, as you tell others about Jesus, as you give your testimony, as you witness for Christ, as you speak about grace and faith and love, as you invite folks to church, as you pray for those who are lost, don't ever, 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 ever give up that God will reach those with whom you're praying. The Bible says in Psalm 126, verse 6, which is the basis for this message, he who goes out weeping, carrying seed to sow. Now we know the Bible says as you sow seed, some lands on good soil and some lands on bad soil. But he who goes out weeping, carrying seed to sow, will return with songs of joy, carrying sheaves with him. That psalm, Psalm 126, was sung by Jewish people that were ascending the hill to the city of Jerusalem. They had been brought back from captivity, finally able to come home. They had been farmers and herdsmen for the most part, but they knew a principle that was inevitable and true, that anyone who plants, even when it's difficult, even when you're hurting, even when you're weary, even when you're weeping, even if the land is barren, if you don't give up, if you don't quit, if you stay with it, the day will come where your night will turn into morning, your pain will turn into joy, your sorrow will turn into victory, and you will be rewarded, you will be blessed, and there will be a return on your spiritual investment. The Bible says in Galatians 6, 9, let us not become weary in doing good. For at the proper time, you will reap a harvest if we do not give up. I want you to write that down first of all in your notes. One day you will reap a harvest. You will reap a harvest. I tell a story in the last, very last chapter of my book about an English preacher while he was preaching. His sermon was interrupted by someone who wanted to give a testimony. And so the English preacher allowed the man to have the stage and he told the story of how he himself got saved and they all listened as this man explained that one day when he was in Sydney, Australia, he was on a street called George and a small white-haired gentleman handed him a gospel track and said, excuse me, sir, I want to ask you, are you saved? If you died today, do you know for sure that you'd go to heaven? And the man said that after he read the pamphlet and he wrestled with the old man's words, he said, I gave my life to Jesus Christ and made him my Lord and my Savior. Well, that was quite a story, but a surprising truth, the English preacher kept hearing this story over and over as he traveled around the world. He went to all these different countries preaching, and wherever he went, seemingly random people he would meet as they gave their testimony would explain that they came to know Christ in Sydney, Australia, on a street named George by a little old man who was handing out gospel tracts. And one day the English preacher decided that he had to meet this person handing out these tracts, so he himself traveled to Sydney, Australia, to a street named George. And he went up and down the streets looking for a little white-haired gentleman handing out gospel tracts. And he finally met a stranger who said, I know who you're looking for. His name is Frank Jenner, and he lives in that little house right down the street. And the English preacher went and knocked on the door. And when the door opened, here stood this white-haired little gentleman. And he said, I've come from a long distance to ask you and to meet you and to find out why it is that you've handed out these tracts, and why do you do that? And the old man said, well, 40 years ago, he said, I lived a reprobate life. I was a long ways outside the will of God, and someone cared enough about me to hand me a gospel tract. I gave my life to Jesus, and he's changed my life for all of eternity. And then he said, I made it a promise to God 40 years ago that as long as I lived, that every single day of my life I would hand out 10 gospel tracts. And he goes, I've been doing that all these years. 
Overwhelmed by his dedication, the visiting preacher began to explain how effective his efforts had been because he explained, as I've traveled around the world, I have met all kinds of people that have been saved because of your efforts. He said, I've actually kept track. Some of them have become evangelists, some have started churches, and the, my best guess is that you have reached about 160,000 people handing out those gospel tracts. And then the frail old man did something unexpected. He began to cry. For he said, up to this moment, I never knew if it had actually done any good. I was simply doing what I thought God wanted me to do. Now here's a man, despite discouragement or disappointment and not knowing if he was actually doing any good, he pressed on. When others would have thought, brother, you are wasting your time. Others would have been saying, you know, brother, you are obnoxious handing out those gospel tracts. But a sum total, a population of an entire city was brought to Jesus Christ because of this man's faithfulness to share the gospel of Jesus Christ. Likewise, according to 1 Corinthians chapter 3, those of us that are saved, we have been called of God to either plant seeds or to water seeds. And if we'll be faithful to plant seeds, and if we're faithful to water seeds, the Bible says that God will give the increase. Now, the Bible doesn't say how many seeds we have to keep planting. The Bible doesn't say how long do we have to keep watering these seeds. It just says you keep planting and you keep watering, and eventually God indeed will give the increase. The second thing I want to tell you, write this down, you need to learn to be as patient as God. Be as patient as God. Some of you lose your patience just getting out of the church parking lot. <laughs> the Bible says, and this is an important verse, 2 Peter chapter 3, verse 9, that God is patient with you. Aren't you glad God was patient with you? I mean, very few of you ever came to know Christ the very first time you heard the invitation. Most of you said, no, don't give me, I don't want to go to church. Someone invited you a hundred times, and you kept saying no a hundred times. And one day, I, it's hard to explain, but one day your eyes were open and your heart was softened. You said, okay, I'll go. And eventually you got saved. And I want to ask you again, aren't you glad God was patient with you? Amen. And the Bible says these words, that God is patient with you. Why is God so patient? Because he doesn't want anyone to perish, but he wants everyone to come to repentance. He wants every single person in this room. He wants every single one of you to come to repentance. Everyone on the west side, everybody in West LA. He wants everybody in New York, everybody in Los Angeles. He wants everybody in the San Fernando Valley, everybody over there in Simi Valley, up there in the San Clarita Valley, over there in the East Valley, all the way down there in the Coachella Valley. Why, he wants every single person living in every single valley. He wants every single person living on every mountain. He doesn't want anyone to perish, but he wants all to come to repentance. And he is patient. He is patient. And we need to be patient like God. You know, baby boomers, and I am a baby boomer. <laughs> baby boomers were born between 1946 and 1964. And... If you were born in the 50s, a little bit before the 50s, or after the 50s, you're a baby boomer. And if you were born in 1946, that means today you're 72 years of age. And so baby boomers today are all in their 60s and headed into their 70s. And it's true, it's true statistically that most people the older you are, if you're not saved, statistically, the less likely the chance are you're going to get saved. Yeah, there's just something about it. Most people come to put their faith in Christ when they're young. So if you're in your 60s or 70s and you're not saved right now, odds are it's not happening. You're not going to get saved. However, don't ever underestimate the power of God. We are seeing more and more baby boomers come to put their faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. Why? I don't know. Maybe because you had everything, you tried everything, you lived in a time in America where we had everything going 
for you and you've tried it all and nothing seems to satisfy you deep down. But I want you to know if you're in your 60s and your 70s, God's never going to give up on you. He's going to keep knocking on the door of your heart. He's going to keep sending messages to you. He's going to keep setting up divine appointments just for you. And uh, you, know, you know who the largest number of people on Facebook is right now? The largest growing demographic of people getting on Facebook? It's baby boomers. <laughs> people in their 60s and their 70s. All the young people are getting off of Facebook. <laughs> it's the people in their 60s and their 70s. You know, we finally figured out technology. <laughs> the kids had to teach us how to log on. But now we're able to keep up with our family and our friends all across the country and see what our grandchildren are doing. But do you know today, because of modern technology, these baby boomers in their 60s and 70s on Facebook sitting there all day long and playing words with friends? <laughs> they had this thing now, it's called Stream Live, and churches all over America are streaming live their sermons on. In fact, this sermon right now, I'm preaching a stream live on Facebook right now. And God, God has had... God's, God's had to wait 60 years for some of you. He's got to wait 70 years for some of you, but he's waiting. He's patient. He doesn't want anyone to perish. He wants everyone to come to repentance. So I say to you again, don't ever give up. Don't ever quit inviting. Don't ever stop asking people. Don't stop ever sharing your testimony. Keep telling others what God has done in your life, and God will give the increase. He doesn't want anyone to perish. He wants all to come to repentance. Number three, write this down. Just reach one. You don't have to reach the whole world. You know, write you a name down. Write your five names down and just say, Lord, give me one of these five. Help me lead one person to Jesus Christ. Because as you reach one, that one might reach another, and that one might reach another. Several years ago, I was traveling with the school our school heritage, it was called Hillcrest at the time, and they always take the eighth graders on a trip to Washington, D.C. So I, my child was in the eighth grade, so I went as a chaperone. And part of that trip, we went to the great city of Philadelphia, and we visited Independence Hall where the Declaration of Independence was signed, as well as the first building that housed the Supreme Court. And of course, we went to the building that housed the Liberty Bell, the bell was originally made in the year 1752 in England and was shipped to Philadelphia. Now on that bell there's a Bible verse, and for those of you that think there should be a separation between church and state, which uh, we'll talk about that another day, but there's a Bible verse on that bell that comes from Leviticus chapter 25 verse 10 that says, Proclaim liberty throughout the land and to all the inhabitants thereof. A Bible verse on that bell. Now that bell is cracked. It cracked the first time they rung that bell. It had been recast several times. We believe it was rung not on July 4th, but on July 8th, 1776, when the Declaration of Independence was read. By the late 1820s, which was 50 years later, the bell fell into relative obscurity. By the year 1828, the city fathers tried to exchange it for a better bell. There was a time where no one wanted the Liberty Bell because it was cracked. It was useless. And yet today, in order to get inside the building where it is housed, you literally need to go through a metal detector surrounded by armed guards who are there to make sure that no one ever damages this now relic of a bell. The Liberty Bell is valuable not because of its inherent value as a bell, but because it had been used at the reading of the Declaration of Independence when our nation was born. It is priceless because it had once been used to declare freedom. Now throughout the Bible we're told stories of all kinds of people for us who have become household names because they were used of God to declare freedom. They have become as priceless to us as the Liberty Bell has become to our country. 
Men like the Apostle Paul, or Peter, or James, or John, or Mary, or Martha, the 12 disciples, and others. Men and women who God used to declare freedom of, through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen? Amen? I want you to turn quickly to Acts 16, as quickly as you can. Turn over to Acts chapter 16. I want to read through this text, and I'm going to read a couple of verses and have you write something down. And uh, we're just going to move through this as quickly as we can. Acts chapter 16, talking about the power of just one person who can then touch someone else's life, who will then touch someone else's life. Acts chapter 16, verse 22, we're here with Paul. Everybody say Paul. The crowd joined in an attack, a mob against Paul and his companion Silas. They were preaching the gospel. And the magistrates ordered them to be stripped and beaten. Verse 23. After they had been severely flogged, they were thrown where? Into prison. And the jailer was commanded to guard them carefully. And the next verse says their, their hands were fastened in chains. I want you to write this down. In God's school of discipleship, suffering is not an elective course. It is a required course. Some of you think, well, if I become a Christian and I do all that God wants me to do, I, I won't have any problems. No, if you do what God wants you to do, you're, you're probably going to have more problems. <laughs> suffering is not an elective course. It is a required course. I want to make this clear. You can be in the dead center of God's will for your life and still find yourself in a mess. Paul and Silas were preaching Jesus Christ, and they got thrown in jail, they were flogged, they were stripped, and they were now fastened in chains in a rat-infested dungeon. So be willing to stand up and share your faith, no matter what it costs, be willing to take a stand for Jesus Christ. Look at verse 25, about midnight, what time? Midnight. What time is that? Midnight. Now, I'm usually asleep by midnight. How many of you are asleep by midnight? Let me see. How many of you are awake at midnight? Mm-hmm. I know you're kind. <laughs> midnight. Paul and Silas stripped, flogged, beaten, chained, rat-infested prison. What are they doing at midnight? They're praying and singing hymns to God. Write this down. Even in your crisis, don't forget your Creator. Some of you, as soon as you start getting in trouble, you blame God and you run away from God. Paul and Silas were in a difficult situation, and they began to worship and pray to a holy God. First part of verse 26 says, suddenly. Everybody say the word suddenly. suddenly. There was such a violent walk. Have you ever heard the phrase, things just went from bad to worse? Here they are in a prison, flogged, beaten, stripped, chained for sharing the gospel, and all of a sudden things go from bad to worse. They're singing and worshiping God, and things get even worse. A violent earthquake. I want you to write this down. Difficult circumstances don't phase God. Don't let difficult circumstances phase you some of you are so i got so many problems listen okay 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 you got problems <laughs> turn to your neighbor and say you got problems <laughs> those problems listen to me those problems do not phase god god has the entire world in the palm of his hand you got some problem god 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 can handle your problems in your marriage. He can handle your financial problems. He can handle your emotional problems. He can handle your health problems. The problems with your child. God's, God's got you, all right? They're not, God's not faced by these problems. You shouldn't be faced by them either. Ladies and gentlemen, hear me out. You've got to stop waking up in the morning and saying, God, would you please lead me to a divine appointment You've got to graduate from saying, Lord, would you please lead me to a divine appointment to this level where you say, where you understand 
that every single person you meet is a divine appointment. In the Great Commission, Jesus commanded us to take his message to the ends of the earth, to share the incredible story of salvation with the entire world. But today, statistics show that most Christians will spend their entire lives without telling a single person about Jesus. We have the ultimate answer to finding meaning and purpose in life, and yet we keep it to ourselves. Is it fear? What's keeping you from sharing the greatest story ever told? Now Dudley Rutherford has released a remarkable book, Compassion the irresistible call to share your faith. Through inspiring stories, lessons from life, and incredible practical ideas, Compelled will teach you the secrets of sharing your faith with friends, neighbors, or anyone. If you call right now with a financial gift of any size to Lift Up Jesus, we'll send your copy of Compelled right away. Compelled, the irresistible call to share your faith. The sheer joy of sharing Jesus with someone else will change your life forever. Hey, thank you for joining in today in our program. I don't know about you, but I just love our program. I love lifting up the person of Jesus Christ. I say this all the time. I think we have the best name for any television ministry going, to lift up Jesus. We need people like you who watch this program, who believe in this program, who understand the intent of our heart to come alongside and to support this ministry. And I know that some of you can do a little, some can do a lot. It's whatever God puts on your heart. But together, I know we can make a difference. We get letters from people all over this country. If we've blessed you, we want to hear from you. But I want to encourage you today that if this ministry has been something that has changed your heart or kept you on the right path or helped you out in some way spiritually, as it's helped you, I know it will help others if only we can get this broadcast on other stations around this country. I want to thank all of you who've ever done anything to help support this ministry. We would not be here without our partners, but we'd like to encourage others to come along and join us. And thank you again for tuning in to Lift Up Jesus and together as we lift him up, I know that we will change this world because Jesus is the light of this world and he'll change each and every heart. Join us every week for another life-changing message from Pastor Dudley. You can visit us anytime on our website and discover the many resources available there to help you with your daily Christian walk. And while you're there, please consider partnering with us to help support this ministry. Pastor Dudley has a burden to reach the entire world with the gospel of Jesus Christ. And we can only do that with your financial help. You can also connect daily with Pastor Dudley through many forms of social media. We thank you for being a part of this ministry and invite you to join us again next week at the same time. Remember, wherever you are and whatever you're doing, don't forget to always lift up Jesus. Jesus.